Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I think we're going to kick start with the next session now. Um, I, we hope you're all as excited for this session as you were for the previous one. Um, and we promise you it's going to be as exciting. Um, so I'll serve as your moderator for the next session. My name is Ashani, and I'm going to give you guys a short introduction of myself. And it's short because there's not much to say. Um, I'm 16 years old, and I'm currently studying in the 12th grade. And I hope to pursue psychology and philosophy in the future. Um, I volunteer at Stimulus, where I currently serve as a head of content. And uh, yeah, being in 12th grade means that I spend my day either thinking about college applications or what to study for my boards. Um, now moving on to the more interesting stuff, and I hope I'm audible. Um, I'll be introducing our next speaker, Professor Sophie Scott, who is the director of the Institute for Cognitive Science at UCL, where she's also a group leader for the Speech Communication Lab. She's an internationally recognized researcher and specializes within the field of neurobiology of human, of the neurobiology of human vocal perception and production. Her work addresses both verbal and nonverbal aspects of vocal communication from sound to social meaning. She is also an occasional comedian at UCL's Bright Club, and I don't think there's anyone else we'd rather learn about the science of laughter from than from a comedian and a pioneering researcher. So over to you, ma'am. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you very much, and thank you for the very kind invitation. I'm just trying to share my screen. I'm going to stop you sharing, if that's all right. And no I'm just problem, choosing my slides. Here we go. And... Um, Oh, hang on. I'm just trying to make sure that I've got the right. Here we go. Can you see? That's yes, not the right thing. Okay, I'm sorry, the wrong <laughs> bit. Right, let's try again. Can you see this talk starting? Does that look okay? Yep, it looks perfect. You can see the science of laughter. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I am hoping to speak for about half an hour, so hopefully there will be plenty of time for questions. But if you do have any points that I'm not clear about, or if the videos or the sound aren't working, do please tell me, okay? So um, I'm just gonna start by, uh, what do I mean when I talk about the science of laughter? What do I talking about when I talk about laughter? Well, I'm talking about an emotional vocal expression. And that's kind of how I ended up studying laughter. I never set out to study laughter. There isn't much scientific research into laughter. And um, perhaps you'll see <laughs> elements of why that is as I go through my talk. Um, and in fact, I started out because I was interested, I was working with colleagues in Cambridge who were looking at the perception of emotion from the face and they were working with patients who had problems recognizing emotion from the face following different kinds of brain injury. And they wanted to test different kinds of ways that we can perceive emotion. So they worked with me because I worked on the voice and I was looking at vocal expressions of emotion. So when I talk about emotion, I am using quite a narrow meaning. I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not, not talking about the experience, but I'm sort of starting with, uh, an emotional expression of some kind to so someone the idea is not just that someone's experiencing an emotion but they're expressing it in some way and how we perceive that so I absolutely am open to the criticism that you know that's just one aspect of emotion experience and how we experience emotion is very important and also of course what I'm working with here are what are called the so-called basic emotions and that's indeed where I started and the basic emotions were first described initially really by Charles Darwin but also then picked up on by psychologists through the last century and people like Paul Ekman, who showed that there are a handful of emotions, by no means all the emotions that people can perceive and produce, but there are a handful that you find in all human cultures. So they're universally recognized. You find them in other animals, certainly in other mammals, and they seem to have different brain bases. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's one particular view. By no means are all emotions basic emotions. Um, and one of the things I found quite interesting about this area was that there was all of the work we've done with faces. There was very little work on the voice. And also, I was sort of struck that so many of the emotions we were working with were one that were negative. So it's always angst and I thought, well, it's interesting if that's what the basic emotions are made to be. Many of those 
Um, excuse me, Professor, I think you're having a few Basic audio expressions issues. of emotion. Have this, you, yes? Oh, no problem. I, I think audio What's issues. the problem? Can you hear me? Or is it just the... It's, it's lagging slightly. So it's buffering. I mean, that is the signal dropping or is it noise? Speak more slowly. I suspect that may just be a problem of the internet. I'm sorry about this. Um, yeah, no, it's perfect now. Thank you. Okay, okay. But do, do, do tell me. Thank you for that. So um, I'm going to, sh that's, a, so I, I'm just explaining really how I ended up looking at laughter because I was looking at these emotional expressions and I was particularly interested in these vocal emotions from the voice. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting about the vocal emotional sounds, these non-verbal emotional sounds that people make. So if you think about the last time you were really frightened, you probably screamed. And the last time you were really found something revolting, you may have made a sort of Ugh! sound. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And actually, those are very interesting sorts of sounds because they're more like animal calls than they are like speech. They have a lot more in common with the way other mammals vocalize than they do with everything else we do with our voices. So for example, here's a way of looking at that. So this is an MRI sequence, which we're running to actually make a video of what's happening inside the mouth and the larynx and the pharynx when someone's talking. So here you can see a woman just speaking English and she's not doing anything fancy, but just look at the amount of movement that's actually happening inside her mouth. It's quite extraordinary and that and human speech is unparalleled in nature for its complexity. No other animal can make the sounds we make and all of these adaptations that mean our tongues are flexible and our mouths are short enable us to make sounds in this way. So if we then compare this, this is so that's human speech. Now here's the same woman and she's laughing. And all of that goes away. You can see the tongue's just resting at the bottom of the mouth. She's opening her mouth. So this, it's a lovely sound, but it's a lot more like any, the way any other mammal is making a sound. So you're making noise at the voice box and then sort of opening your mouth to let it out. There's nothing else more fancy happening. And interestingly, one of the other things you may have noticed um, and is obviously kind of implicit in a lot of emotional expression work is that frequently when we produce emotions, we're not doing so voluntarily. Um, you might have screamed before you realized you were making a sound. And that seems to be because of these nonverbal emotional vocalizations, they arise via a different and an older evolutionary pathway in the brain. So when we speak, we recruit these regions, you can see them here in pink, called lateral motor areas, which are really important in speech production. And in fact, you only find them in humans. Other mammals don't have these areas. However, when we make emotional vocalizations and we produce these involuntary sounds, this is much more to do with an older pathway that's coming up through the brainstem and projecting up to the cingulate cortex. And that's the same pathway that controls vocalizations in other mammals. So often these emotional sounds can be much more reactive and much more involuntary. And I think that's very interesting when we think about laughter. And I want you to keep that in mind throughout my talk, because sometimes frequently when we talk about laughter, we think about involuntary laughter. But there are also lots of examples where laughter is a lot more communicative, i.e. a lot more like speech. And maybe that has some implications for how laughter works in the brain. I we actually think at the the, the technical aspects of how laughter is produced and actually laughter is more like it's been described as more like a different way of breathing than anything else and breathing is very interesting in the human body you're all breathing right now um, it's very important please don't stop and if I look at your breathing during what's called metabolic breathing which is breathing to get air in and out of your lungs what you see is a very smooth pattern and this this is just tracking here this very smooth pattern that's just tracking the movement, the expansion and contraction of the chest as you're breathing. So if you look at the actual in detail, in between the ribs in your chest, there are these muscles called intercostal muscles. And when you breathe in, 
you contract those muscles and it pulls the rib cage up and out. So that pulls air into your lungs and then you relax them back down and you breathe out. So you get this smooth cycle. And of course, this is not specific to humans. You see this throughout um, certainly van, uh, vertebrate land mammals. Um, when we start talking, humans have another completely different use of these intercostal muscles. When we speak, we take a breath in and then we use those same muscles completely differently. And the way that we use those muscles is in fact to control the flow of air that's passing through the voice box, which is where we make the sounds that we use for our voice. And if I keep talking without taking another breath, my intercostal muscles start to have to work really, really hard. And in the end, I'll run out of air altogether. So you're probably thinking, well, Sophie, that was very interesting, but quite strange. Why did you do that? But actually, we can only talk at all because we have this control over our breath. And we have this control over our breath because humans walk upright. And unlike all other mammals, which have to use their intercostal muscles to support their weight, certainly all the land mammals, that's we are freed up. So just like our hands have changed through evolution because we don't need to walk on our hands, our chest, the control of the muscles in our in our rib cage is different because we don't need to engage those muscles to support our weight. And we've used that, we've repurposed that for voices. As soon as we start laughing, you see a very different pattern again. What you see now is very, very big, very, very fast contractions of those same muscles. So again, if we just take a measurement at the chest wall, you get this zigzag pattern. So you can see it's much faster than breathing. And it's much, much larger than what's happening during talking. And that's giving you the sounds of laughter. So laughter is actually a very primitive way of making a sound. It's just squeezing air out of you. So each ha, ha, ha sound is just one big contraction. And if those sounds run into one another, well, if those contractions run into one another, you get sorts of spasms where people start making <laughs> sounds as well. So we don't have a good understanding of why but if there is a competition between breathing for speech, breathing for stay alive and breathing to laugh, laughter will often win. And I'm going to play you an example of that happening now. I'm going to use an example of somebody talking who's on the, um, the BBC Today programme, which is the main BBC news programme on, on every morning during the week. It's a very serious news programme. And what you'll hear is that the woman who's about to read the news hears something that starts to make her laugh what I want you to notice first is what happens to her voice before she starts laughing and see when you can start to hear her voice change. Um, I'm sorry, Professor, is the yeah. audio playing yeah. right now? Yes. Um, I, I don't working? think we can hear it. No, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, could you hear the audio for the um, the M fMRI the MRI sequences I played before? Oh no, I just thought you were okay. showing no, no, the no, muscle no, no, movement. No, don't worry. No, in that case, it's because I haven't pressed. I'm just going to stop sharing and start again, okay? Sure. Okay, give me a second here. Um, the problem here is that I have broken my computer screen. And I cannot see the bottom. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's not your fault. It's entirely my own fault. So I'm just going to move it up, see if I can actually see that. Here we go. Share computer sound was not ticked. I will try that again, OK? I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to start. I'm still sharing, aren't I? Yeah. So, OK. I'm just going to go back and then go forward again. So listen for the change in her voice. Cinderox's unpopular replacement has now been dismissed, with the army's popular chief of staff, Jack Twat, taking over. A 40-foot sperm whale, which was stranded in the Firth of Forth for more than four days, is now thought to be swimming towards open waters again. It freed itself late last night. Marine experts are hoping to establish this morning whether the whale is finally back at sea. Good luck to the whale. Ten past eight is the time. An investigation is underway at the maze. So um, you, you may have heard the man coming down the line has to say the name Jack Twat. And it's not a very big or very clever joke, but that's quite a rude word in, for British English speakers, certainly where I come from in Britain. And back in the studio, just before she continues to read the news headlines, someone leans in to the woman called Charlotte Green and whispers, Jack Twat. 
right at her and they're doing that for one reason and one reason only they're trying to make her laugh and it works it takes a couple of beats but then the first time you pick up is that you start to hear her losing control of the pitch of her voice and that's because she's losing control over her breath and she's losing control over this very fine control of air at the voice box and then by the end of it the pitch of her voice shoots right up and then she starts making squeaking sounds because now she's laughing the, the striking thing here is that she does not want to laugh. She will get in trouble for this. The BBC does not like people laughing on the radio. So that's how powerful the effect is. It's also the case that if you're not a native speaker of English, you may not realise that she was starting to laugh, but you will have picked up something emotional in her voice. And that's, that's obviously still a very big tell. It's a very important component of how we hear emotion in somebody's voice. Now, of course... Everything I've shown you so far, we've done with laughter. It's just been done in Great Britain. We've just been working with our own culture. And one of the really important things that you need to do if you want to show this in emotion or explore whether or not an emotion has these um, characteristics of basic emotions, it's critical that you show that they're recognized in other human cultures. So my PhD student, Disa Sota, who is looking at these positive as well as these negative vocal emotional expressions, she had the opportunity to do several trips out to northern Namibia, where she was working with members of the Himba tribes. And these were really communities that were not contaminated by Western culture. So they have not encountered somebody from outside of their community. One or two of the men, once or twice a year, will in interact with Angolan cattle traders, but that's it. So if these people who don't have electricity, don't have a written culture, they're not seeing people from Great Britain on the television, they're not seeing them on film, they have not encountered them before. If they recognize emotions from the voice from people recorded back in Great Britain, and if we make recordings of the Himba and play those back in Great Britain, if they recognize each other, that would start to suggest we might be looking at these more uh, universal aspects of emotional expression. Uh, what we did, so as I said, we, we didn't just play the voices from people back in Great Britain to the Himba, we also recorded the Himba. We give them scenarios where they might feel different emotional states and we asked them to express them and make a sound as they do that. And here's a gentleman doing that. <laughs> now um you get absolutely no prizes at all if you spotted that at the end there he started laughing in fact if you listen carefully you can hear people laughing because he's the, the, you're not testing him on his own and his friends are all there and they're laughing at him while he does this and then in the end he gives in and starts laughing as well the emotional expression he was uh, producing before then um you may have recognized it um you may have thought, if you can't recognise it, you might think, well, does it sound like it has a lot of energy to it? Does it sound positive? And it is positive and it is full of energy. It's in fact an expression of triumph. It's a triumphal sound. He has achieved something. I think the example here was, was catching and killing a cheetah. Um, and that was very interesting because this is not an emotion. Some emotions are so culturally specific that they don't really mean anything when you get to another culture. And that's not what we're talking about here. The British group and the Himba group both know what triumph means. However, when the British produce a sound to express triumph, which is often a kind of woohoo sound, or that's not recognized in Namibia as sounding triumphant and vice versa. When the Himba produces I, 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 I sound, that's not heard as sounding triumphant back in Great Britain. It's not a basic expression of emotion. However, the laughter does seem to have this recognition recognition so the English recognized the Himba laughing the Himba recognized the English and that's actually what we found when we look at the data so we we tested these negative emotions that have always been test examined from the face in the past we've got anger disgust fear sadness and surprise those are cross-culturally recognized so if you're in the middle of the Namibian desert and you scream with fear a member of the Himba community would know what expression what, what you were expressing the only positive emotion, we tested things like triumph and pleasure and relief. Uh, the only positive emotion was actually the expression of laughter. Um, 
You'll notice I've kind of dodged what emotion laughter is actually expressing. I think it's probably worth noting at this point that Darwin, who actually wrote a lot about laughter, thought that laughter was an expression of joy. And I want to think about that a bit as we go forward from here. Now, of course, we should have realised that laughter was a very good candidate for being a universally recognised expression of emotion and possibly a basic expression of emotion because as per Paul Ackman's suggestion of what basic emotions are, laughter is also not only found in humans. We are not the only animals that laugh. Now, interestingly, for humans, you first see laughter emerging when infants have an interaction with their parents, normally uh, tickling. It can also be things like a game of peekaboo. Um, so that's a pretty much a universal across a human communities where the question has been asked. But strikingly, the same is also true for chimpanzees. Chimpanzees laugh, and you first see laughter appearing for chimpanzees when infants are tickled. And these sorts of, obviously with human babies and chimpanzee babies, you can't just march up and start tickling. The baby has to let you do that. But it's a very interesting um, thing. And the, the striking thing is that for tickling, you, you have to have somebody else there. You cannot tickle yourself. The, the, your body knows when it's you touching yourself and tickling just does not work that way. So it looks like you're actually seeing something that from its outset, the expression of laughter is something that happens in interactions. And it seems to be a very important part of forming social bonds. And of course, for humans, it appears very early. We, laughter appears at around two months old. So it's, it's one of the first, it's the first positive emotion that we start expressing with our voices, for example. So you find laughter in humans and chimps and it's even been described in rats. Now, of course, it sounds different in rats. You, it sounds more like a sort of chirping sound, whereas chimpanzee laughter, which sounds like a kind of <laughs> sounds more laughter like. But laughter in rats seems to work the same way. And indeed, laughter is first seen in rats when infants are tickled. And this suggests that at least it is possible that laughter is something that might be more commonly found across mammals because I think it's probably fair to say no one else is really looking for it. It's not a very interesting emotion to a lot of people. Obviously, I don't think that's correct. Now, one of the reasons why we might imagine that there's more laughter out there is that laughter is actually very strongly associated with play and all mammals play. Play is really important to mammals. Mal mammals have relatively large brains. They have an extended period of being juveniles when they develop those large brains and they learn things and they learn behavioral patterns and they learn about their environment and their social world. And often the way that they learn, not exclusively, but frequently they learn through play. So play is associated with uh, quite species specific behavior. So dogs play differently from cats and Horses play differently from um, stoats, but it's, it's, it does have some commonalities. So you tend to find animals need to show that they're playing because the same behavior, if it's not interpreted as play, could just be aggression. So they tend to have this uh, thing called a play face. It's a loose, kind of open, happy smile, the very unthreatening mouth. Um, you can see it here on these pictures of dogs. And in fact, dogs, play is so important to dogs. They have something called play bow. When dogs do that, what that means is everything after this is a game. We are playing. I might growl, but I'm not cross at you. So these are signs that the behavior, they're sort of framing the behavior. They're providing contextual information to indicate that your intention is playful. And effectively, when there is a noise associated with this behavior, that's laughter. That's how laughter was first found in the rats. Um, and you see very similar patterns. So there's play face in chimpanzees and human infants. It's really hard to get pictures of play face in human adults because they tend to tighten up into a more social smile. So I just want you to notice how very much like a chimpanzee my brother looks in that photograph. Um, but effectively, it's, it's, so our laughter is exactly the same as, as chimpanzee laughter in that it is found in very similar contexts. It's found during play. And to the extent to which at its heart, if you were to say, look at play and laughter across the wider range of animals, um, Panksepp, who did the work with the rats, said that at its heart, laughter is an invitation to play. Come and do this behavior. Let us do this lovely thing. Um, here's another study that we did with laughter. So this is showing you brain activation. So what you're seeing in the picture at the top is activation shown in green. And when I say activation, it means there was neural firing in those regions. 
And what this is showing you is neural regions that are recruited, that are activated when people hear emotional sounds. So most of what I'd done back in the sort of 90s and early noughties was looking at the um, how the brain responds to sounds and to speech. And I'd started working with these emotional vocalizations and I thought, well, it'll be interesting to take those into the brain scanner. And interestingly, what we found was in some ways not like speech. So what we could see, these regions shown in green are brain areas that are activated when you hear emotional vocalizations and when you yourself move your face to start to make a sound. Now, those are called mirror regions. They're regions recruited both in perception and in production. And they are very, very strongly recruited when you hear emotional sounds. However, they're not recruited in the same way across all emotional sounds. They're much, much more strongly, you can see here in the purple and the blue and the red, much more strongly associated with high arousal sounds and very positive sounds. So the more arousing and the more positive the sounds are, the more they drive this mirroring response. And interestingly, that means you get the greatest effect actually for laughter. Now, this was not something we were expecting. It wasn't a study of laughter. We were looking at a study of these emotional vocalizations, but it seemed quite interesting. And then it also chimed with something else that's quite strange about laughter, which is that laughter is very, very behaviorally contagious. Very often when you laugh, you are laughing just because other people are laughing. You can catch a laugh from someone, even if you don't know why they're laughing. And you're more likely to catch a laugh from someone you know than someone you don't know. So it's still a very social behavior, like the, the tickling laughter, but it's something that we're almost like primed to do when there are other people around us. And that is actually quite interesting because emotional expressions are emotionally contagious. That's their job. If I go, this is disgusting, you should feel a little bit because that's how I'm telling you this is a horrible thing without you having to find out for yourself. You're very unlikely to start going as well, though. So the very interesting thing about laughter is it's not just a, an emotional expression. It's one that we join in with, even if we don't know why the person is experiencing it. I've got another example here of some a contagious laughter actually happening again. This is on live radio. It's a joy to be able to talk to people in India who I think will probably get the relevance of this. I always have to explain to people in America what this means, but it's two men who are doing a cricket. They are summing up that day's cricket. And it was a game in 1990 between the English cricket team and the Australian cricket team. And one of the men makes a very bad joke and then he starts laughing and see what it starts to do to the voice of the other man. OK, so I put a big arrow there to show when the joke happens. And again, the pictures of the voices are shown in blue. So you'll notice the man who's talking, his voice goes up in pitch when the. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right hand. He hat. tried to do the splits over it, and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed. He's smiling. Having 131 and minutes why, and that's why the pitch of his three voice fours. And um, then we had Lewis playing extremely well. Not quite laughing 47 yet. not out. With the other uh, man was slightly. laughing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was joined by De Freitas, who um, was in for 40 minutes, a useful little part ship there. Uh, they put on 35 in 40 minutes, and then he was caught by Dujar. Now, at this Walsh. point, the man who's been talking, he's smiling. He's been affected by the joke, and he's been affected by the laughter of the other man, but he hasn't started actually laughing himself yet. Now he takes a breath and starts to speak again, and all hell breaks yeah. loose. He completely stops being able to talk. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batting for 30, 35. Get a little whistle. 30, 35 minutes, hit a four over the wee keepers. And now he's lost. Beggars, for goodness sake. Jonathan Agri tries to speak. Hit a four. Yes, Lawrence. Lawrence. Completely overwhelmed. Brian well. Johnson comes back. Hit, hit. hit a pitch. He hit a four over the wee-keeper's head, <laughs> and he was out for the <laughs> tough old kid. <laughs> Batted for 12 minutes, and then was caught by Haynes on Patterson for two, and there were 54 extras, and he got all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. So again, there's a lot to love.
be absolutely furious that they'd been laughing and they wrote off and wrote a letter it went straight off and wrote a letter of apology at the end and the BBC did tell them off because they don't like people doing this and I also really like the way you can sort of see that very natural development of the laughter so first starts with a smile and then you get laughed and then towards the end the man who's speaking he's, you can see the pitch of his voice come down and he says I've stopped laughing now you're seeing that kind of very natural development and then going away of the laughter but the other thing that's really striking about that is almost immediately those two men are not laughing because the joke was funny the joke was not even slightly funny it's a very weak joke almost immediately the only reason they were laughing is because they're both in the same room and they're both laughing and it's just behavioural contagion. They're just setting each other off. It's why he kept saying, oh, Agas, do stop it. Because what he means is if you stop, I'll be able to stop. And they just can't. It's a very, 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 we learn to laugh in this way. We learn to laugh, to, to, to laugh in this contagious way. But once we've learned how to do it, it's very, very hard not to do it. And of course, it's got this strong social element to this. So I think now one of the things that's quite nice about li listening to that at the distance of 30 years is you can, you can hear friendship in that laughter. If those two men had hated each other, they would not have been laughing in that way. Which brings us to adult humans. So adult humans in laughter is very interesting. And this is work that's been done largely by the psychologist Robert Provine. Because if you look at adult humans in laughter, we really like laughter and we'll try and find examples of laughter and try and make ourselves laugh. But actually, most of the time, we don't really understand why we're laughing. So still most adult laughter is for social reasons. We are, if you ask people about jokes, what makes them laugh, they talk about jokes and comedy and humor, but actually, it's still primarily social. You're 30 times more likely to laugh, three zero, if there is somebody else with you than if you're on your own. And that means that most laughter happens in conversation because that's what actually happens when, we're when we are with other people. That's how we communicate is by talking to each other. We laugh more than we think we do. Every study with the proviso that there are a few studies of this topic finds that if you ask people how often they laugh and then you look at people and can see how much they laugh, Everybody laughs more than they think they do. Everybody underestimates their laughter. It's all mediated socially. So the more you know other people, the more you like other people, the more laughter there will be. And what this means is actually in practice, humans have a very uh, nuanced way of using laughter. So if you actually watch people laughing, we will laugh because things are funny. But actually in those conversations, laughter has a really complex role. We can laugh just because other people are laughing. So it can be purely, purely behavioral contagion. We will laugh to make and maintain social bonds. You'll laugh to make a new friend. You'll laugh with friends you've already made. We will laugh in conversation to show that we agree, we understand, we remember, we recognize. We will actually laugh to get other people to agree, to understand, to remember, to recognize. What Robert Provine found was that at any one point in time in a conversation, the person who laughs most is the person who's talking. So it's really communicative, a lot of laughter. And we will laugh to reframe things as play. And this is something I will come back to right at the end, but a very common, you think about play as laughter as a sign that you're playing. Well, people will use laughter to say, it's all right, I'm fine. This might have start, started off looking he might play but actually we're fine and this is fun <laughs> now listen to that laughter <laughs> this i didn't realize it was going to play immediately i'm just going to go back off of that um we tried to ask questions about this because if you think about it and i suppose this is the last kind of point i want to make if you think about it what i've done here is i've talked about two different kinds of laughter i have talked about people laughing absolutely helplessly and i've played examples of people who could not stop laughing and then i've talked a lot about laughter and conversation and if you look at laughter and conversation it looks a lot more like speech in that is timed like speech people coordinate their speech and their laughter when they're talking to each other people laugh at the ends of sentences they don't laugh all the way through, or not always. And in fact, it's even true they're having a sign language conversation where they could laugh all the way through if they wanted to, and they don't. We, we laugh in this very precise, coordinated way. And that makes me think, sometimes when we're laughing, we're laughing helplessly in this really reactive way, like I described at the start. But also sometimes when we're laughing, very often when we're laughing, it's a lot more communicative, and maybe it's therefore at some level, at a brain level, more of a voluntary action. <laughs> So you listen to this laughter, you think that's actually somebody laughing absolutely involuntarily. And in fact, that's me, that's my laughter. It's, and that's what my, I have a very high pitched laugh when I'm laughing in a helpless way because I, I couldn't actually choose to get my voice up there. That is me watching something happen that makes me absolutely howl with laughter. 
here's a, here's a different kind of laugh. <laughs> now that's a more communicative laugh and you could probably hear it was lower in pitch it has a sort of nasality to it <laughs> it was shorter and what we we made these laughs by literally setting up the situation where we could get people helplessly laughing and then we got the same people laughing in a more conversational way and what we find is people are very good at telling the difference between the two and that's because the spontaneous laughs are high pitched. They are they are longer. You get these funny squeaks and whistles in there. Um, and interestingly, if you take it into the brain scanner, we didn't tell people it was a study on laughter, and we didn't tell people there were different kinds of laughs in there. But it doesn't matter. Your brain tells the difference. What you see is a lot more air. These areas shown in blue. That's auditory part of the brain. That's much more activated by that spontaneous, the real laughter, the stuff you can't stop doing, possibly because you hear sounds in that context that you'd never hear in any other context, possibly because it's absolutely unambiguous. And interestingly, you get more activation for that communicative laughter, that laughter that at some level is, is voluntary in terms of brain systems. It's more like speech, possibly. And now we're not in brain areas associated with sound. We're in brain areas here in medial prefrontal cortex in particular and the dorsal thalamus, which are associated with mentalizing, with thinking about what somebody else is thinking. And I think that's an indication that in fact, we are, when we hear someone clearly laughing intentionally, <laughs> we're always trying to work out why. Are they laughing to try and get someone to like them? Are they laughing to pretend they understood a joke? Are they laughing to cover up being really upset? And of course, these are all different ways that in the real world, people do use laughter. All that you can say for sure is that that person was laughing at some level with an intention behind it. They weren't laughing helplessly. And even if you're having a brain scan, you're trying to work out why. Interestingly, there was one last wiggle to this. Do you remember I showed you that um, study earlier on that I said looked like contagion in the brain because you can see people's brains getting ready to join in when they hear laughter. Well, we were expecting that to be a much bigger effect in this study for the spontaneous laughter because people always rate the, that sort of laughter as a lot more contagious. And actually, that's not what we found. What we found is you get this priming response for any laughter, real or posed, communicative or spontaneous. What's different is across people. So we took people out of the scanner. And we gave them a test where they had to classify the laughter into these two different kinds of laughter. And what we find is the more they the score on that, that test, the better they do discriminating laughter, the more earlier when we scanned them listening to any laughter, they'd shown this priming response. So it's not just um, contagion. The more you're getting ready to join in when you hear laughter, the better you understand what that laughter means. Now, um, I've always liked this quote about laughter. Um, laughter is the shortest distance between two people because it's kind of getting to this sense of intimacy about laughter. But it looks like it might be even more important than that. So there's very interesting work coming out of the US where there's been studies of how married couples use laughter. And what they find is couples who deal with stressful situations with what they call positive affect, but they mean laughter, not only get less stressed, but they are the, people, the couples who stay together for longer and are happier in their relationships. So it's not because laughter is a little bit of like magic dust that makes everything okay, um, because it only works if both members of the couple laugh. And I think that gets back to this idea of using laughter to sort of show that you're okay. That's You can use it, you can sort of say, oh, it's a sign that I'm playing. But in quite difficult situations, if you're with someone that you have this emotional closeness to, you can use laughter to improve both the mood for both of you if you laugh together. And the laughter, being able to use laughter in that way is actually a very positive sign about your relationship. And I don't think that this is going to be limited to romantic relationships. Again, I think that's often what we mean by friendship, people who we can laugh together with and then feel better about difficult situations. So laughter is funny and laughter really matters. And if we go back to Charles Darwin's idea that laughter was an expression of joy, I think the only thing I would add to that is that the joy we experience and we're expressing when we laugh is a social joy. It's a joy that happens much more often when we're with other people, with the people that we like, the people that we love. So it's probably a scientist's time that we started la taking laughter a bit more seriously. Thank you very much. And thank you to all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for that amazing, oh wow, they're all wearing 
clown noses as well. Uh, so thank you so much for that amazing talk. Um, I realized that my camera was on halfway and I think everybody who's attended this talk can tell you that I didn't stop laughing during that entire talk. Um, we have so thank many you. questions for you. So Brilliant. I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, if you have never seen a person laugh, laughing seems to be a very dangerous process then why should it have evolved in such a way involving diaphragmatic spasms and potential chances of a, oh my god asphyxiation yeah no it's it is it is very interesting laughter stops you breathing stops you talking it's just squeezing air out of you i mean it is trying to kill you and there are a lot of examples of people you know if you are co compromised in a cardiovascular sense laughter is a risk thing to do I was reading an example of a study where people were trying to use um, laughter therapy with people with chronic pulmonary obstructive disorder which is very serious problem of the lungs and they had to stop the study because it was simply causing people too much stress stress on their heart stress on their breathing I am very interested in this because I think it might be a difference between humans and other animals in this respect certainly other primates so chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas they laugh like us it's very very recognizable and they laugh in play interactions and they laugh in tickling they don't seem to get so absolutely incapacitated as us and also we laugh on an exhalation we go ha 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 and then we're pushing air out and it actually you can hear people gasping for breath trying to get the air back in chimpanzees and other apes don't laugh like that they go he 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 so they break they're still getting air coming in and out even while they do it so they're not incapacitated and they're not becoming low in oxygen and i i i almost think sometimes one of the the things that laughter has come to signify maybe why we do get so incapacitated with laughter and so at risk from laughter is that you only ever really laugh like that when you are feeling very close to someone. You have to feel, you know, you feel safe enough that you could be intimate enough that you could be this vulnerable almost. So, I mean, that's a hypothesis. I don't know. But certainly it seems to be a very... So, for example, you can actually measure changes in postural reflexes in humans when they start laughing. We become weak and floppy when we laugh and other animals don't seem to do that quite as severely. So there must be some reason for that. I, I, I agree. It doesn't seem like an advantage in terms of evolution, but maybe it's an advantage in terms of immediate social meaning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, often people use laughter as a coping mechanism during stress when they want to express themselves. What does that tell us since we associate laughter only with joy? Well, I think because laughter is a joy, joyful expression, and it's a socially joyful expression, but also it's a very socially appropriate, you know, we, we use it in this very communicative way. So think about people having laughter in conversation and using it to show agreement and understanding. And oh, I get that illusion, you know, I recognize what you mean, I've been there. So laughter is already kind of being co-opted for this communicative role. And I think in that role, it's a very socially appropriate way of masking other emotions. So you can, people will use laughter to cover up being embarrassed or angry or sad and, or, you know, in pain or embarrassed. So, I mean, you, there are other ways of managing emotions and, you know, there, interestingly, this work from the US by Robert Levinson, he finds looking at couples, there are other ways people use emotion to deal with stress. So some people use aggression just shut up and stop talking about it. Other people use what he calls passive aggression, which is just going blank, just, just ignore it. And they tend to not get less stressed. They tend to say, stay stressed. So I think laughter may not only be socially appropriate, it also has the benefit that if it works, it will actually make you feel better. And it works when other people join in, basically. Mm -hmm. And then so... There is quite an interesting literature on how high stress jobs like the police or medicine, medical staff use laughter and humour in the workplace as a way of bonding, excluding outsiders because the laughter is often at quite dark things and dealing with the stress. And mm -hmm. so it's very, very, it's, it's a very 
you find that different professions tend to often have different things they lo- jo- joke about, but it's like the more high stress the profession, the more you need to work together as a team, the more mm-hmm. you'll find laughter and jokes that are very profession specific become really codified. So I think that's an important part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, laughing at times, especially in excess and out of context, is commonly observed as maladaptive behavior in several children with pervasive development disorders. How can play or sensory stimulation help reduce maladaptive nature? I don't know. I don't know. I think the, it's probably in the eye of the beholder, because if we can't understand why someone's laughing, we tend to be a bit uncertain about what it could mean and because laughter doesn't happen randomly so for neurotypical people you get very specific situations people laugh when they're with other people they laugh particularly when they're with friends they'll laugh in certain contexts I mean if you set up a comedy store and you're trying to build an environment where people will laugh together even if they're strangers you know you you want people to feel safe and like they're not you know rats don't laugh when they feel at danger and humans won't laugh if they feel like they're actually in a dangerous situation so that's You know, although we don't think of it this way, neurotypical people's laughter is actually very predictable in some ways. So when you see laughter that's not predictable, someone appears to be laughing in a way that has nothing to do with any of these cues, it's harder to understand and it does seem wrong and it seems strange. I think the only other thing I... Sorry, go on. No, I'm so sorry. Please finish your answer. (laughs) There's just one other thing that I think may mix into this. Laughter and crying, so sobbing, um are the only two emotional expressions that you find associated with um, unwanted production. So in adulthood, um, either associated with a degenerative brain disease or brain damage, you Mm. can get conditions where people laugh even though they're not amused or they cry even though they're not sad and they don't want to and it doesn't mean anything, but it's absolutely involuntary and it's there. You don't get that with other emotional expressions. So I also sometimes wonder if there's something about the wiring of those Mm -hmm. emotional expressions that may mean they have a different kind of access to production. That means they they may be being produced for purely neurological reasons. If it happens in adults due due to brain differences, there is no logical reason why that couldn't also be true in developmental disorders. So it may be sort of not attached to any kind of emotional elements. It may be a, a misfiring of one of these behavioral patterns. Mm-hmm. So there are two questions uh, which I feel like relate to this answer of yours. One is why, why do we feel the urge to laugh when it's an inappropriate response? Like not in a um, neurodiverse person, but just normally like in sad situations or in serious situations, it's quite, it's quite common. <laughs> so why does that happen? I think it's often because people are trying to use that sort of making everything better with laughter thing. And we notice it when it's wrong. We notice it when you've misread it. Um, Somebody sent me a clip of a, I think she's an Israeli soldier. There's a, she's a a female soldier and Mm -hmm. she's at a wall and then a bullet hits her and it hits her just here, like right next to her head and you see it hit the wall. And she turns and looks at her initial reaction is laughter. Like, oh, that didn't hit me. I'm all right. And then she starts to look quite shaken. Mm-hmm. You know, so the actual, as the, so that kind of immediacy of laughter as a sort of, oh, that's fine, is very, mm-hmm. very, you know, we, we learn to do that a lot. So sometimes it's just that kind of thing. I think sometimes laughter is, it, it sometimes bleeds more into a sort of shock response. So, so I, Certainly, I've, I've heard from people who have a couple of times have been in like very difficult situations, like there's been car accidents, there's death, it's awful. And then mm. someone they were with, who's, you know, they've been coping with the situation, dealing with the situation, and then when the police have left and the ambulances have left, have just started mm. laughing absolutely hysterically and were unable to stop. And that seems, again, I think that's more getting, you know, sometimes laughter can just be a straight down the line shock reaction. And it's, it's more like that kind of neuro degenerative laughter where there's, there's, it's not reflecting joy. It's reflecting, it's reflecting the severity of their emotional state. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question that's quite common is um, again, related to laughing and crying. So why do people laugh and cry at the same time? Or why does um, why do periods of laughter often end with people crying? 
Well, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is that I've, I've emphasized here emotions that are basic emotions that you find across all human you know, groups and in other animals. Production of tears is really odd. You only get tears, emotional tears in humans. Other animals don't do this, possibly because we don't have hair on our faces and you can see the tears. And you get tears associated with, with sobbing, crying. You get a lot of people when they start laughing, they start producing tears. If I start laughing spontaneously, the first thing that happens is tears just start shooting out. Um, and some people, somewhat fewer, often more women cry when they're angry. And we don't know what that means, but it's interesting that the two most common contexts for production of tears is crying and laughing. And actually crying and laughing are very, very similar. They're similar in the production of tears. They're similar in terms of how you make the sound. They're similar in terms of when you start doing it. So babies can cry from very soon after they're born and they use laughter communicatively. My, I, when my son was little, I could tell if he was in pain or if he was tired or if he was hungry. At one level, all of those were crying, but they were, he cried differently for those different things and it worked. And you can kind of get overwhelmed by laughter and crying. Again, in this sort of like they, they, they stop you doing other things. When you start crying, you can't, it will hang around for a while. So, so if you think of comparison, of like, oh, like a surprise sound or a disgusting sound, you don't then keep making that sound for five minutes. So I think mm. they must have a lot of strong similarity in terms of actually the neural systems. And in fact, it's a much less enjoyable talk. So I didn't give it to you today, but I can give you quite a similar talk. To on crying because we've done a lot of um, experiments <laughs> with, with getting people really sobbing which is awful but um it is you know that so i think one of the reasons why they go together is because actually there's quite they have quite similar effects so most people feel better when they've been crying i didn't believe this result because i don't feel better when i've been crying but 80 percent of people no. have an improved I, I get a headache i'll, I'll go to great lengths to avoid <laughs> crying i do not like crying um but I'm, I'm, the, I'm the outlier here. So in fact, they're both ways of feeling better. They're both ways that can overwhelm you. They're both, they're quite confusable sounds. You know, if you see someone, you yeah. don't know them. That woman who was reading the, the news story about the whale, she could have been crying. You know, you might have thought she was starting <laughs> to cry. I've gone next, but yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think that's why, and I think that's probably why they have that kind of um, mixability probably at a brain level. And I suspect also there's this kind of, it's not just they overwhelm you, but you are vulnerable and you are pushed mm -hmm. to some really extreme places sometimes for a prolonged mm -hmm. amount of time. And I think that's why they are both confusable and also it can feel like you're sliding between them. Definitely. Um, there's a really interesting question, I think. Um, laughing releases endorphins. Is it only valid for genuine laughter or does it work with fake laughing as well? It works with works with fake laughing. Even if you just go ha 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 ha, really, really fake, it works. Oh, okay. Um, what happens in the pseudo bulbar effect? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong. No, no, no. Um, that and that's actually what I was describing with the the laugh, the involuntary laughter that's not mm -hmm. has no mirth associated with it. Can also happen with mm -hmm. crying. Exactly. That's the. I don't um, know a great deal more about it, but that, that, that's something that's very interesting about laughter and it is something we're trying to find out more about and crying. Another part of this question was, could the contagious laugh in this case have an advantage over the persistent crying? I said, well, that's interesting because what you don't get with crying as much, certainly in the UK, it is not a behaviorally contagious emotion. You might feel bad if someone's crying, because mm -hmm. it's the emotional contagion. Mm -hmm. We don't use it, we don't catch it in this contagious way. Now, bearing in mind that with contagious laughter is something we learn to do. Mm -hmm. I have a student who's from Taiwan who's pointed out that in Taiwan, people will use crying a lot more publicly than they do in the UK. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at funerals, you will often have, particularly if you're in a more rural area, you will mm -hmm. have a professional weeper who will cry into a microphone. And the idea is that you're kind of getting everybody going. So there's, you know, I think these, the emotional contagion, the behavioral contagion thing might be a bit more flexible and maybe mm -hmm. more culturally specific, but it's interesting that it's certainly, um, who knows about other emotions, but it, it's at least possible there might be elements of that with crying. 
Um, I think we were able to broadly cover all of the questions today because a lot of them were similar. Um, in case anyone else has any more questions, is there anywhere they could contact you? Absolutely. If you, I, I can't get into the chat because I've broken my computer screen, but do you feel free my email address? <laughs> no but yes, feel I to put this in the chat, but it's just sophie.scott, S-O-P-H-I-E dot scott at ucl.ac.uk or I'm on social media so you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Sophie Scott. So please feel okay. free to get in touch. Thank you. Done. I will put it. I will put it in the chat. Um, thank you so much for taking out the time Pleasure. to um, give you. this talk. And we also heard that you were recently diagnosed with you know what. And just thank you so much for taking out the time to give a brilliant talk. <laughs> and I'm I a lot better. It. Thank you. I can't <laughs> taste anything, but I'm a lot better. Thank you. Thanks. As long as you're good. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.